the censor board decided that they would not allow your film to be shown. That was it. It was full stop. So I called it Bharat Ek Khoj. It was done in Hindi. Correct. And there were 53 hours altogether from ancient India to modern India. So you have to consider yourself, you know, as representative of humanity mm -hmm. as it is, as yeah. it were. That is truly timeless. So, so the first thing I want to ask you is contrasting storytelling when you became a filmmaker and contrasting storytelling today. When you look back at your journey, your very epic journey, what were some of the challenges you faced then and the challenges you see filmmakers facing now? What has stayed common and what has changed? As far as cinema is concerned, there is, it, it's a question of how technology has needed to be used in order to make storytelling really effective. If you look at the history of cinema, automatically you know what the whole situation was. Because, you know, first there was a theatre. Now, in the theatre, the audience and the players are in the exactly the same environment. Sure. The person who's performing to the audience, they have a special relationship. Sure. It depends on whether the audience is interested and how much the audience is interested and how much does the person on the stage want the audience yeah. to actually be involved or alienated or whatever. But this, as soon as you bring the technology of cinema, there is no such situation. Yeah. You know, whatever happens has happened once and it will go on repeating itself. Yeah. So therefore, when you work in the cinema, one of the important things is when you're working in the cinema is that you have to become, be conscious mm -hmm. that once you said something, it's there forever. Right. There's no going back. Yeah. There's no going back from yeah. that decision which you took. Right. Right. And it uh, remains there. Yeah. So you cannot change it once that's been done. Right. These days, of course, one of the hot topics of debate and discussion is freedom of speech. You know, young filmmakers, we all go through the whole discussion of, oh, we can't make what we want to make because of this sena and that sena and so on and so forth. Now, you made films in a time where society had a very narrow-minded view as to how films should be made. Narrow-minded or a very one, one focused view of how films should be made. In that society, you made films like Mandi and Ankur and Manthan. So when you look at the problems we face today as far as freedom of speech are concerned, do they look trivial to you? No, I think, you see, each generation has its own uh, problems. Yeah. And uh, in the case of the, in the world as it, ex as right. it exists, right. particularly in our country, yeah. one of the things is that, you know, there is a, in terms of media use, Correct. a lot more people use media today. Sure. And social media, there's practically no, uh, no kind of, um, censorship mm -hmm. on social media mm -hmm. and uh, therefore censorship which was such a big deal at that time right and uh, and you know because it meant that if the censor board decided that they would not allow your film to be shown that was it it was full stop right there were no other avenues yeah no other avenues yeah. today there's no such thing right because of that the sense of responsibility of a person who's doing anything mm -hmm. in what is essentially social media, you have to be much more responsible. Sure. At that time, you left the responsibility to a body outside of yourself, mm. which was the to regulate you. Yeah. Government. You know. Yeah. So, so you said, well, as long as the government allows you, it's got to be. You, you <laughs> can do it. Yeah. But you never thought for yourself. Yeah. Whether it was the right thing to do or not. So, you know, the sense of social responsibility, in fact, becomes greater when there isn't... When there isn't a, a government yeah, body. No, no big brother. Yeah, yeah. that's you a very know? interesting way of looking at it. Yeah. So, you know, what's interesting is your first film that I saw was Zubeda when I was a child. And then I saw, you know, Welcome to Sajjanpur. And then I started seeing Ankur and Bhumika and so on and so forth. So I discovered your brand in a reverse chronology, in, in, in a sense. As a filmmaker, is this, you know, we talk about our brands and our storytelling brands. Is this something you ever went through in terms of when you had 
set a name for yourself. I can only make this kind of you cinema. You see, no. no, it wasn't like that. The point was that I was always very interested in the cinema. And uh, from a very young age, also I was very familiar with the cinema. And being familiar with the cinema had a lot to do with the fact that my father was a professional photographer, still yes. photographer, but he took a lot of interest in moving pictures. Yeah. And so he had a little uh, camera, right. 16 millimeter camera, and his, uh, you know, advocate was to make movies about his children. And uh, he and he had large numbers of children. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, right. we made lots of stories about. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm one of ten. Yeah, children. So yeah. my father made a film of every one of his children from the time they were born until the next child came. And we grew up yeah. with these films being constantly shown mm -hmm. to all manner of guests who came mm -hmm. for, for dinners or for teas or whatever. And uh, at the drop of a hat, my father was willing to show them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, so it was a very familiar thing, you know, to be, yeah. the cinema was very familiar. Yeah. And therefore, expressing yourself through films yeah. right. was also much easier sure. on account of that, which is the reason I made my, my own first film. I made with my father's film camera. camera. But that, that was when I was about 12. You know, so there was no, uh, so it's not um, something that, you know, I could think of as being unique. There was nothing yeah. unique about it. Yeah. So, in fact, in my in my case, I know that the, when when Chatterjee Ray made his first right. film, Pratip Panchali, in college, I just yeah. got into college at about that time. And um, my oldest brother, when I, on one of my visits to Calcutta, yeah because my brother used to live there, that was his home. And he said, you know, I mean, uh, since you're so uh, crazy about movies and you talk about genre noir and all this kind of thing, why don't you go and see one of our own filmmakers? I said, who, I mean, what film? He said, a film called Pater Panchali and it's running in such and such cinema. And I went and saw that film and I kept seeing that film every day as long as I was in Calcutta. So I must have seen it about 15 or 16 times while I was there. Because it's one of those things. Right. Know, because it just, just caught, I'd never seen anything so original and so uh, seemingly effortless, natural, you know, like it belonged to life. Right. That kind of quality. Right. Which we were dying to create. Yeah not knowing how, because we were stuck with a particular form of cinema in our country, you know? Right, very true. So switching gears a little bit, uh, my, you know, my favorite work of yours is Bharat Te Khoj. And uh, I read somewhere that when it was offered to you by Doordarshan, you actually wanted to make one of the epics. Yeah. Is, is that true? Yes, I wanted to, in fact, I, I you see, the, the Doordarshan at that time uh, had become suddenly national. Yeah. In the late 1980s. 80s, yeah. In the process, one of the things that the government of the day thought, of which I was also mm -hmm. part, that, you know, television should not simply copy from the cinema, popular cinema. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, a, it's, it's not meant to do that. Yeah. It has to create its own market and um, audience and so on. And then, of course, there was the idea mm -hmm that uh, the government, if it has a media like mm -hmm. this under its control, sure. then it is their responsibility yeah. to use it usefully for its population. Correct. So what was the usefulness? The idea was that most importantly, we have to raise the literacy level of the country. Mm -hmm. sure. And uh, therefore, that was one of the first things that they thought of doing under Mr. Gandhi, which actually did happen. Happened, yeah. Then the other thing was that why don't we, because we had such a rich mm. uh, tradition mm. in everything, and particularly in terms of epics, mm -hmm. and all of this, you know. So they said, why don't we have, for instance, use mm. uh, our great epics? So 
the whole idea was that you had Raman, then you had Mahabal, and then you had third, what is the third thing going to be? So I was at this meeting that was, well, yeah. invited as a filmmaker, and so somebody, Ramanan Sagar, said he would like to do Raman. So they said, yes, go ahead and, and do it. So and then someone else was Bihar Chopra, he said he would like to do Mahabharata. Actually, I wanted to do it, but then they gave it to him. Right. Because he was a senior filmmaker. Sure. I was just a junior, you know. So I said, um, well, I've got to do, I want to do something. So he said, what would you like to do? I said, look, I want to do Discovery of India. And the, the book that Jawaharlal Nehru wrote, I mean, it is his version of Indian history. We will probably require to augment it in order to give ourselves our history via television, which in this country, we have never had any means Correct. of doing. And before that, the only way we got any history was in classrooms. Yeah. And those were awfully written textbooks. And most of those textbooks, the origins of them were some colonial writers, uh, not even our own writers. So I said, all that can change. Yeah. And so I decided. So I called it Bharati Khoj. It was done in Hindi. Correct. And there were 53 hours altogether from ancient India to modern India. And it was not just Nehru's discovery of India. That was the base. Right. But the fact is that I had three different ways of looking at mm -hmm. it. One was the, our traditional way of looking at our history. Sure. That was one aspect of it. The other thing was the way the academics mm -hmm. were uh, studying history or wanting us to learn history. Mm -hmm. That was the second. Mm -hmm. And the third was the book itself the discovery of India. Right. So I had these three levels mm -hmm. to work simultaneously. There was a person who took us through right. history, which was Om Puri. Om Puri. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. So that was, he was taking us yeah. through that. While there was a kind of God's voice situation, right. you right. know, so to have you, update, you know, take you through history, which was, which was a kind of overview. Yeah. You know, Om Puri was speaking lines from Discovery of India. The traditional and the academic right. historians right. filling in where there were gaps yeah. in Nehru's book. Nehru's book. Yeah. And the third one was how traditionally we were had, yeah. how history has been used. So you know, for instance, the story of Tipu Sultan. Or, sure. You know, and even Ramayana Mahabharata, yeah. so many Ramayana, so many yeah. Mahabharata. Mm -hmm. So we used all the different forms, yeah. different theatrical forms, right, right, as well as katha forms, yeah, to tell us stories. So, so you know, I was born in 1988, and uh, the interesting thing is, Bharat Khoj was created in an India in which I did not exist. So I've always wondered now, you know, 30, 31 years later, if you were to retell the history of India, we're still telling about a time before 1988, would it change just based on how society thinks today? Because okay. history is history. history. It doesn't change. It's a way of looking at history that might change. How will history, history itself will not change. Right. But the way we look at it yeah. will obviously change. You see, it depends because today we look at the world in a slightly different way. Sure. Than we did say 30 years ago or 40 years ago. And certainly at the time when Nehru was writing, it, writing the book, uh, which was in the 1930s yeah. mm -hmm. and into the 40s. Mm -hmm. So by the time discovery of India came, it was, he'd just come out of jail. So it was around the time of independence, little before independence. From then to now, it's over 70 years. Now, the fact is that obviously, the world has changed mm -hmm. in the Indian experience itself has changed enormously. And for the present generation, the idea that we were a colony mm -hmm. itself is it, it's not easy to imagine what it must have been sure. as a colony for people who didn't have experienced it. 
and didn't even know. So all of those things we put together, you do need, you have a viewpoint that obviously different. Yeah. So which film of yours do you think remains the most relevant in your opinion? You say films are very notorious for their short lifespan. Sure. Only because, you know, the, the, the record, the world as it is at that moment. It's Even not if you're dealing with history, you're dealing with history as perceived at that time. Yeah. Yeah. You don't know. So, right. so it's, a, it's one of those things that it's, it's, makes it stick to that particular time when it was made. Because of that problem, to, it, it's very difficult for films to jump out of their time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and be in some ways timeless. And that timelessness often comes from the subject matter mm -hmm. and the way you look at it, which is universal, mm -hmm. which, which goes past your own time. And what is it that will make it so? Is your ability to deal with in everything in humanitarian terms. Sure. So you have to consider yourself, you know, as representative of humanity mm -hmm. as it is, as yeah. it were. That is truly timeless. Right, right. So if films have that character mm -hmm. built into them, they will last. Mm. Others don't. Right. Makes sense, absolutely. Thank you so much, sir. Really appreciate taking out the time. Thank you so much. Thank you.